The Audrain Automobile Museum is proud that Subaru of New England is the presenting sponsor of our exhibition, JDM and Beyond, the worldwide influence of Japanese automobiles. Hi, we're here at the Audrain Automobile Museum in our exhibition, JDM and Beyond, the worldwide influence of Japanese automobiles. Today, Ben Chester and I are taking a look at three truly iconic Japanese cars. This Nissan Skyline GTR, the legendary Acura NSX in its most potent Type R version, and the rally legend, the Subaru 22B STI. Ben, this is a car that probably more than most others really sort of fed that fire of the people who were dying to get their hands on JDM products, looking through that window that they couldn't quite get through the locked door, unless of course you had your computer on and you were playing your video game, in which case you had thousands of kilometers on the wheel of this Skyline. Absolutely, that's, that's well said. Uh, in Gran Turismo, it was easily achievable. Uh, and it really wasn't achievable in the United States until really 2014, 2013-ish. Um, I remember actually looking for one of these on Craigslist when I was looking to buy a car for college, uh, realizing that parts might not be easy to get. I kind of moved on from that dream. Uh, but Nissan really set out to make the absolute best sports car in the world, bar none. They weren't trying to make the best car in Japan. They weren't trying to make the best car they could. They wanted to set the standard for what an all-wheel drive, twin turbocharged sports car could offer the world. And I think for being a 30 plus year old car at this point, I think they succeeded in that aspect. This is a car that happens to be one of my favorite cars by any manufacturer anywhere. And I love it for a couple of reasons. One is because the idea of a car built for racing, built for performance, the Japanese Group A racing, and it was quite interesting because they actually deliberately put it up two classes in displacement just so they could use all-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely brilliant. And also the fact that this is based, because I'm GT car guy. Mm -hmm. I'm not sports car, wind in your hair guy. I don't have hair. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm GT car guy. And the Skyline, which is a, um, uh, a model that they actually inherited from the Prince company which built Skyline that was a top of the line model when Nissan bought them. This is a luxury GT. Think mm. about a Porsche 928 mm. and the kind of comfort and ease you have mm. in performance. The racing version of these puts out you know far in excess of 600 horsepower but the the 300 and some odd horsepower that the street version puts out is amazingly usable yes and this car is as fast as you want it to be while you're sitting in great comfort. Yeah, That yeah. to me is the ultimate in performance. No, that's well said. And that, that was really Nissan's goal was to not just make a fast car, but to make a car that you could use in multiple environments and be comfortable while doing it. Um, with the twin turbochargers, you have torque and power from very low in the RPM range. Obviously you have grip in any sort of conditions at any time of the week. Um, but really it's, it's the whole package that brings it together. And they essentially claimed when the car was new, and they weren't far off, that the harder you push the car, the better it would grip due to its torque vectoring all-wheel drive, the all-wheel steering. Uh, but this car really was an intuitive driving experience uh, that you could take on road trips, beat anyone at the track, and really do anything with uh, anything that you wish to in your life. You mentioned a couple of things which, again, uh, are repeated themes throughout this exhibition. The application of technology for practical purposes. Mm. The fact that the Japanese pioneered the combination of all-wheel drive and rear-wheel steering yeah. for a very, very practical point. Mm -hmm. The fact that they wanted to make sure that you could put that power down in a very, very reliable and consistent way. Yeah. And again, it brings me back to the fact that the Japanese are car crazy. Um, some of the roads in Japan are absolutely amazing roads, mm -hmm. but again, they are very strict about their speed limits. Yeah. Now we'll see in uh, a future video in this uh, exhibition what happened when people sort of stopped really paying attention to the, to the speed limits and did something which is sort of uncharacteristic socially for the Japanese, but let's not get ahead of ourselves because right now we're concentrating on the way Japanese manufacturers take power meant for the track mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and apply it to the street in a way that people hadn't thought of before. Oh, absolutely. And I just also wonder the sort of the what if. Mm -hmm. What if when these cars were new, they had marketed these in the US, I think they would have had a huge hit on their, yeah. their hands. And I think that's part of the reason why you didn't see these cars in the US. I think, uh, I think people who were in charge in this country, I'm not gonna point fingers, I'm not gonna name names, but I think there was a serious threat to these cars being the best cars in the world and the United States wasn't really having it. Well, it was a very interesting thing. Um, the United States, of course, did have import limits on the Japanese car makers uh, for a long time, which, of course, they went around by actually establishing manufacturing plants right. here in the US. Um, and in fact, today, just about all of the Japanese nameplates that you see on the roads are all built in the US. Yes. Um, so it sort of brings us a question about what is a foreign car? Is it right. a nameplate? Is it where it's built? But that's a philosophical discussion, which we'll have another time. But it is something that is interesting because they wanted to also make sure that they could fulfill their quotas with cars that were easy to build, high profit, and easy to maintain. Mm -hmm. Cars like this, they weren't going to sell 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 of them and try to service these things that far away from Japan. So, right. um, But the next car we're going to look at is proof of again, how a Japanese manufacturer totally redefined a segment. Well said. The, as we know it, Acura NSX, but we will look at a Honda NSX. Let's go. Ben, I'd like to offer you a test, a quiz, a pop quiz. Donald, I am ready for your quiz. Excellent. Okay, an exotic sports car derived from race technology has got to have a 12-cylinder engine, right? No. Oh, of course, so it's got to be a V8. Mm, no. You mean you can have a six-cylinder high-performance sports car? Yes, you can. Indeed you can, and it was Honda that proved it to the world with the NSX. Mm -hmm. And this is a car that people, I don't know if people can really today appreciate in the world where we've got V6 Ford GTs that mm -hmm. win at Le Mans, mm -hmm. the impact that this car had. Mm -hmm. The idea that you would have a world class leading sports car with a six cylinder engine mm -hmm. from some Japanese manufacturer was ludicrous, yeah. except for the fact that, of course, Honda was a company that's always been known for great engineering, mm -hmm. and they had another secret weapon, which we see on the wall behind us, who happened to be driving for a Formula One team that used Honda engines. Yeah. And there are some race car drivers who are very good at helping manufacturers develop cars. One that comes to mind is Michael Schumacher, and the work he did with Ferrari. But Ayrton Senna's role in the NSX and what it became is absolutely amazing. He was not involved in the design of the car, but once the car was designed, he flogged it around the track at Suzuka, quite famously in a wonderful, brilliant video that we all absolutely love, and we think, oh, a couple of afternoons practice, that'd be me. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least I could wear the loafers <laughs> and the white socks. Um, but also at the Nürburgring, back before everybody and their mother drove a family sedan around the Nürburgring. Mm -hmm. And Honda listened. He came back after every lap and said, the car's a little loose here. They bolted a brace in. He took it out again. Okay, that's better. Now it's a little loose there. And they developed the car in a way that few manufacturers ever thought of doing. Mm -hmm. And when they got to the point of this, the ultimate NSX, the Type R, all the high performance Hondas, of course, are Type Rs. Mm -hmm. And all of the Type Rs were Japanese market only. Yeah, you, you said it, Donald. The NSX changed the world and really changed people's perception on what a supercar is. Um, the NSX was the first supercar I saw in person. And I remember being with my dad and he basically said, look, this is a Honda that's beating Ferraris. And that's all you had to say really about the NSX. But the V6, it was reliable, it was tossable. Uh, the R version obviously heightened all the senses, stiffened the suspension, everything about it was a bit tighter. But this was really like a pair of old Asics driving shoes. They just fit perfectly right around your ankle. There was no flimsiness. It was tight. It was secure. 
everything was where it's supposed to be, everything is direct. Um, this is one of, in my opinion, the greatest sports cars of all time. And today in the horsepower wars, okay, sure, it doesn't maybe even have 320 horsepower, which today is, is nothing when you, know, you can buy a Corolla with 300 <laughs> horsepower, which is absolutely shocking. But this at the time, they shed 260 plus pounds out of the standard car, Recaro buckets, no radio, no power steering. No air conditioning? No air conditioning. Um, this was really the most direct sports car you could buy in the world at the time. And the standard NSX also proved that a high performance sports car could also be used every day. Yeah. Now it doesn't have a great deal of luggage space, but it has more luggage space than a lot of cars which followed. Mm -hmm. And it still made a very practical tour. I would dare say that the only car in this period that offered high performance and touring ability was a Corvette. Right. And the chassis dynamics of the NSX, mm. with apologies to Corvette owners everywhere, mm -hmm. were just in another league. Yeah. And when you think about the fact that they took, as you said, the NSX, which was already a terrific performing car, and they, in the words of Colin Chapman, added lightness. Mm. And it was just absolutely amazing. And again, one of those things that is just a performance icon, sort of, again, one of those JDM masterpieces and something that is incredibly desirable today. As collector cars, of course, the NSX is one of those cars that really had a very, very, very narrow depreciation curve. Mm. Of course, they were new cars, they depreciated. However, they've been appreciating for a very long time now and well at the top of the heap is the NSX R yeah, Type yeah. R. And it's also wonderful, uh, the little details, the fact that all of the Type R's come with these competition white wheels, which mm -hmm. I think is such an incredibly cool thing. Most of them, of course, that we see are red or black mm -hmm. or perhaps silver. Mm -hmm. This green is a very, very unusual green, Goodwood green, mm -hmm. which is absolutely stunning. It suits the shape so well. And it's interesting that this car also, you know, we, we talked about the smaller cars in another segment. And the idea for the NSX apparently came about um, because Honda Engineering was fooling around with a mid-engined version of one of their K cars. Mm -hmm. And they put it all together and thought, hmm, this is sort of interesting. And the engineers that are working in the race department thought, I wonder what we could do with this if we sort of did a different kind of a chassis and a different approach. And of course, uh, Honda also built at the same time their K car mid-engine, the Honda Beat, mm -hmm. which again is as far away from the NSX as you could possibly imagine. And again, shows the kind of range that Japanese manufacturers had and still yeah. have to this day. Yeah, I think Honda in my, I had a Honda for my first car. And since the first day I drove that car, Honda has been my favorite manufacturer. And this car and this era really put that out to the world, right? And helped the world understand how dynamic Honda was. I mean, they essentially took a front subframe from an Accord, flipped it around with that engine modified and put it in the back of this car. Um, and objectively, it's a great idea. But I mean, just if you look at the room here with Eileen Prost's MP44, we've talked about the Trail 55. We've got, you know, other Hondas in the room like this Civic here. Um, Honda makes generators, Honda makes lawnmowers, <laughs> Honda makes tractors, Honda, Honda makes, makes robots, Honda makes private jets. Like their range of, of um, how dynamic they are seems to never end and they continue to evolve as a company today. An interesting point that I think is worth talking about for a minute is also the fact that you just mentioned how incredibly established and, and meaningful a brand Honda is. Honda, like many of the Japanese manufacturers, elected to, when introducing upmarket cars, introduce the Acura line. Mm -hmm. And around the entire world, this vehicle was the Honda NSX, mm -hmm. except in America, mm -hmm. where it was the Acura NSX mm -hmm. to be the, the flagship of their luxury car line. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of an interesting thing, and you, you wonder, much like uh, the Ferrari Dino said, you know, what was it about this car that they couldn't call this a Honda? Mm -hmm. Because after all, at the same time, they were winning Formula One races as Honda. Right. So why not sell the car as Honda? But that's a discussion for another time. We've got lots of discussions for another yeah, time. We've we got, to do. We've got the entire to channel. About. We're just going to have the Ben and Donald discussion for another time YouTube channel launching soon. Watch this I space. think there's a uh, podcast there. Oh my gosh, there you are. And we're now going to look at 
for me in this exhibition, I love homologation specials. I love the world of World Rally Championship. And we're going to look at one of the ultimate homologation specials from World Rally ever, the Subaru 22B STI. Let's go. Do it. And the final car that we're showcasing in this segment is a car that I really, really love. Now, I said I love the Skyline. I do love the Skyline. But I am an absolute sucker for rally homologation specials. We talked about this before. We mentioned it in the exhibition preview video that I love the Lancia Delta Integrale. And the entire idea of World Rally Championship cars is so amazing because these are cars deliberately designed to be rendered unstable at the turn of a wheel. Mm -hmm. And that's how they win events. Mm -hmm. And this car is one of the most fabled of the World Rally Championship homologation specials, the Subaru 22B STI. Uh, this car is also loaned to the exhibition by our good friend Ernie Bach Jr., uh, who is the head of Subaru of New England, our presenting sponsor for this uh, exhibition. And this is among 22Bs, which are special cars, mm. this is a very special 22B, one of three prototype examples. They only built 400 of these cars. They built three of them with serial number 000, mm -hmm. two of which they gave to their leading drivers. Mm -hmm. At this point, they had won three World Rally Championships. Mm -hmm. And the third one retained by Subaru Corporate, their press department. And this is that car. Yeah, it's a stunning, stunning, <laughs> stunning automobile objectively. Uh, being kept in such a good condition. Uh, but these cars to drive are probably some of the most dynamic cars on the road in any conditions um, at any time um, with uh, differential changes, um, with a wider body, different suspension throughout the whole car, um, a forged block, uh, the engine was bigger than the standard uh, Subarus of the time. Everything about this was unique too the 22B, which was odd at the time for uh, a car that they only made about 400 of. So Subaru pulled out all the stops for this and it really paid off. I mean, if you put this car in any condition at any time, you could probably get out of that situation with this car. One of the things that this car also points out is something going back to the very dawn of the motor car. Manufacturers had to prove themselves in competition. We've seen in a previous highlights video, the very first car that the Subaru company built, the 360, and we are about as far away from the 360 as can yeah. be imagined. Yeah. And it's no wonder that Subaru has established itself globally as a manufacturer of really rough, robust, mm -hmm. dependable cars. Mm -hmm. And how do you prove that best? In World Rally Championship, it's, you mentioned the hardened block and all those things. Mm -hmm. You have to make a car that's fast, yes, that handles well, yes, but that also finishes the event. Yeah, yeah. And what better way to prove yourself than in WRC? Yeah, yeah, that was one of the best leagues of racing ever. I mean, it was just addicting to watch. You know, Group B was great. Obviously, it evolved into the WRC, you know, in the next decade, in the 90s. But if you are a fan of the WRC, you think of blue Subarus. And you know, this car is essentially the most direct road going version of any race Subaru of all time. Um, so they really, you know, were able to transition to the road really well with this car. But um, these cars on the rallies were so unbelievable because drivers like Colin McRae were able to drive them like they weren't on a slippery surface at all. And the differentials and the all wheel drive worked so well, along with the power band that was just such a flat, even, uh, torque curve from down low all the way to the top. Um, they were able to drive these cars so confidently and essentially the trick was from what I've read, of course I haven't been able to slide a car like this or drive it, you know. I've seen you in some parking lots in the snow. It wasn't this. quite sure. Don't tell Ernie, it wasn't this car. <laughs> uh, but these cars, essentially you just turn in and wherever the front wheels aim is where the rear end will go. So if you need to make a tight turn and you stay on the gas, it'll essentially just work the rear wheels to get the rear end around, not push the front end through when you are not riveted to your computer or phone or tablet watching the Audrain Museum network, which you should do every day, mm. 
because you're a subscriber, so you do it every day anyway. But you must watch some highlights of World Rally Championship to see what those incredibly talented drivers and co-drivers, because yeah. a driver has to have complete trust in their co-driver because they're telling them how fast to go, what gear to use, yep. and what's coming up next, which he or she cannot see. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, you, you might catch me as a rallycross driver in one point in my life, but you'll never catch me as a co-driver. I mean, the type of slope, the type of turn, like you said, how fast they're going you know, how they're entering the turn. If, if any of those things are wrong, the whole weekend, and maybe the season is over. You're off the road and upside down in a heartbeat. Right. And something else you said about the characteristics of this car also I think is very smart in that, again, I said I love homologation specials. The homologation specials that I love are as capable in their way on the street as they are in competition. Yep. And that's one of the other secrets about these Subarus is the fact that you can use the capabilities that they have on the street, on dry tarmac, and not sliding it around a corner, it gives you such confidence in the driving. Yeah. And they're cars that you can drive very easily, quickly. You don't have to drive fast, just very quickly. Yeah. You find that that uh, on-ramp, this is all theoretical and not in the state of Rhode Island, but you find that that on-ramp that might have a 40 mile per hour limit on it is easy at 65. Yeah. Because you know exactly what the car is going to do, how it responds to your input, and it's remarkable. Yeah, yeah, this car, you know, and we're looking at the R32 right here, and that also with all-wheel drive and all-wheel steering, that's great. That car is a hot rod, okay? Let's just get that understood. That car has more power from 1989 than any car ever should have at the time. Like, this, that car was beating everything. But this is an intuitive driving experience. This has about the same power, but everything feels very flat. Everything feels very uh, balanced and stable. And, you know, the, the all-wheel drive works in a way that keeps it very um, even on the road. It doesn't allow you to understeer, but it doesn't really allow you to oversteer unless you really push it in a way when you're losing traction, it'll do that. But it, it just keeps you under control at any speed and under any circumstances. And that is the mark of a truly great competition car, much like the Lancia Stratos. Mm. It has got a fearsome reputation for doing terrible things to the limit, but the people who take a car like this to the limit are very talented people indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And this car can be as kind to you or as mean to you as you want it to yeah. be. Yeah. And it's absolutely astonishing. And this exhibition would not be what it is if this car wasn't in it. No, no, it absolutely wouldn't. And uh, I will say just a PSA to all those who are coming, even though this car isn't here, you still cannot bring your vapes into the museum. <laughs> so we do hope you enjoy the show. And this car is an absolute pearl with just 50 miles on it from new. And uh, we're just thrilled to have it here. It's absolutely astonishing. And again, just another example of the Japanese influence worldwide on automobiles. Thanks for joining us in this video, and we'll see you in our next segment.